This is Music Biz Mentors. It used to be called um, The Cool School. We've been doing this for four years, um, doing panels and workshops for musicians. And so um, the whole idea for us is if you're ready to hear what our, our workshop's about, you come to it. We didn't want to have a membership where, oh, I paid for it, so I have to go, you know, that kind of thing. So um, we're doing this every other month if we can. I talk people into coming to, to share their knowledge with you, and sometimes we'll just have one person that does a specific workshop and things like that. So um, that's what we do here. And so um, we share it with your other friends, and so this grows. Sometimes we have 15 in a room. Sometimes we've got 30 in a room, whatever it is, it just as long as it's going to help you. That's, that's the whole idea to do this. So um, the, the theme today is I wanted the... I wanted to pick musicians that are doing music for a living. And they've all chosen to do music for a living and make a living at it. So um, I know you have a lot of questions for them, but they all do specific things. So um, I want to just I want to start with um, Gerald over here and just, just tell, I, I'm going to start with in the past like five years, what have you been working, you know, what do you do? Because I know you started at one point and then grew from there, and so currently, what do you what do you do as a musician? As a musician? I work at Starbucks. <laughs> no, you never know in this business. Um, for the last five years, I've been focusing mostly on teaching, and that's come through uh, having a studio since I moved here in 1992, which built, took a long time to build, but it's, it's pretty steady now, and I've had some interesting um, opportunities to work with, like Al Pacino for a film, and just different people like that, that are, are actors and not really singers, so I had to take them through the process. So that's been pretty incredible. And then uh, sight reading, I teach at classes at the Guild for singers to learn how to read music so that they can work in the business. And then it's up and down. I was talking to somebody earlier about the, the film and TV stuff. Everything's changing so fast with the Internet and with social media and with how things are sold. So our jobs change year, year to year. So we'll go a couple of months with nothing, and then we'll go, like this last month was really busy. We probably did, I don't know, 12 projects last, this last month. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of pieces of a lot of things for sure. Yeah, singing. Yeah, singing. Yeah. He also plays his butt off, too. <laughs> okay, sure. Hey, everyone. My name's Joy. Um, five years ago, right around five years ago, my wife and I started a company called Lab Hits, and we licensed music to TV shows. So my time originally at that point was making a lot of tracks, and we had a few friends on board. And then a few other friends came on board that wanted to make more tracks, Robert being one of them. <laughs> and um, we just kept getting more TV shows that we licensed to, and we make music custom for TV shows, as well as have the catalog ready to go. So if somebody calls up and says, hey, we need some hip-hop tension, we have it. You know, If they want something specific that's different, not quite the norm, then we can make it on the fly and send it off to them. And... Hope they use it. And like you said, uh, the business is changing a lot every year. Now, Facebook's got their own show. Uh, Verizon's got their own show. So aside from TV, there's other places that you can license music. And some pay royalties, some don't. Some are direct licenses. And we handle all that. So now, my schedule is a couple of days a week, I'm doing music, and then the rest of the time, I'm taking care of the business end of it, mostly. Screening tracks. I'm um, uh, Harold, Harold Payne, and um, I have kind of a diversified portfolio, but parts of it have not changed that much from when I started, which is I'm always playing at least a couple, three nights a week at regular places that I've been playing where I do cover songs, original music, and improv. I do a lot of um, improv. When I play in clubs, what I try to make it 
distinctive by making up songs for people on the spot. Either it started off playing in a place where they've had all these birthdays, and but it really sometimes I'll just observe something or I'll have a conversation with somebody. Like I played this house concert the other night, and there was somebody that was uh, a gentleman from Taiwan, and he talked about how he used to play the violin, and then for 30 years he hadn't played, and uh, then he picked it up again, and and uh, he was really excited about it. So I, I just, instead of asking for a title from the audience, which I often do, I just made up a song about him. And it's evolved over the years that that's one of the things that people know me for. But so I play clubs, and one of my main things is doing custom songs for special events where I create a song. Sometimes it's one song. Um, you know, I'll, sometimes somebody will fly me to the East Coast to do one song. Um, it's, it, you know, I connected with some meeting planners, and uh, so it's kind of a featured moment where I'll do uh, one or two custom songs and maybe an improv or a recap improv where I recap a speaker or something like that. It's something that's evolved over the years for me. So, uh, and then I'll, I'm connected with a positive music community, which is kind of cool. A lot of singer-songwriters that play kind of positive music, and I through that, it's kind of overlaps with this, some of the New Thought churches or whatever, like Unity and Center for Spiritual Living, so I play some of those, and sometimes I do songwriting workshops, and so I think having a diversified portfolio is, is helpful, because everything changes, and then you, you pull out this thing, and you can do that, okay. and um, so that's what I'm up to. Can you tell them how you how you started singing, and how you moved from really being a uh, a singer to you were you've been teaching for a long time and coaching and stuff like that, right? So, and then how you moved, you know, your movement from where you kind of started. I know you got a great story. Um, I grew up in Mississippi, so we were very religious. <laughs> you want to call it that? I grew up in the church. I, I don't know what I would have done without that because it was my life. So that's where I started singing and playing, and that was my music background. Um, went to a local college there and majored in classical piano and got a degree. And then I had always heard since I was a little kid all the commercials on the TV with the singing, like the theme songs to TV shows like Good Times and the Jeffersons and... I would hear these voices and I would tell my mom, "That's I want to do that. I didn't know what that was called, but I wanted to be those. I didn't want to be the star. I just wanted to sing on those projects. So after I got my piano major, I moved to Los Angeles in 1990 and went to Grove School, which is no longer here. A lot of those people went to MI. But, um, and it was a full year of commercial and jazz music. And so I did that for 11 months from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, six days a week. It was pretty intense. Um, then I was done. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done with all my education. I, I'm going to go back to Nashville and get in the contemporary Christian uh, singing. And went to Nashville, had zero luck. I worked at a potato chip factory for a while. I stuffed Ms. Piggy lunchboxes for a while in a factory line. And... I don't know, about six or seven months of that, and I thought, you know, this is, this is, this is not what I bargained for. <clears throat> so I headed back to L.A., and, and then it was a long road. It was a long time getting in. I moved here when I was 25, and I got my first job when I was, my first official singing job when I was 33. So about eight years of being here and, you know, paying your dues, which was I played in the hotel bars, and I had a church job. <laughs> I'd leave church and go to the bar, play in the band. Um, I, substitute, I was a substitute teacher in LAUSD in the Crenshaw District for eight years, and I worked at La Mocha Coffee Shop for a couple of years. So I was just always working and working trying to get into singing. And I did all the, the sort of the side jobs, I guess, is, is kind of how I thought about it. Um, 
And then in my 30s, I met a lady in one of my classes that I was taking who hired me for my first film, which was Behind Enemy Lines. And then it, it sort of took off. I mean, obviously, it didn't take up overnight. But at that point was sort of the turning point to where I started doing film and TV. And then I moved on. I think one of my biggest projects was Glee. I worked with Tim Davis on Glee. And a quick interesting story about that. Um, when I was 19, I'm from Mississippi. Tim Davis is from Texas. We end up in Colorado in a room together at a national competition, a national uh, music competition. And I was his roommate for a week. So I was 19, he was like 21 or something like that. So fast forward 15 years later, I'm on a session out in LA and we run into each other and re you know, know each other's name and it's like, yeah, I roomed with you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So because of that connection, even though it was such a short period of time, he was new to town and needed tenors for this new show that nobody knew anything about called Glee. So he called me in to do all the demos of all the like Steve Perry songs and stuff to shop the show to get it on air. And then when it got on air, um, he, had me, he had me come because we knew each other from that random instance. The point of that is talking to through your life and through your situations like that. And it's all those little really interesting turning points that make your career, make, make it really interesting. So that's how I ended up. And then, and then I started working. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Um, I grew up as a total metalhead. So <laughs> it might have been a little different. So cool shirt there. Um, but I did always, yeah, this was back when I had hair. Okay. And um, I could swing it around. And if a Motley Crue song comes on, I will still bang my head <laughs> and then go, where'd the hair go? But um, I always liked a lot of styles of music and I worked on it. So even though I'd be doing metal shows, I was still listening to disco. I was still listening to Top 40. Um, so when I first moved out to L.A., um, I was about 19 or 20. I had done about 300 shows by then. And they were all local bars, cover gigs, playing ACDC, Dawkins, stuff like that. And um, my first audition in L.A. was Alice Cooper. And I didn't get that gig and ended up about the same amount of time, like you said, about eight years, you know, doing cover gigs. And there'd be top 40, there'd be some rock, whatever I could get, whatever I can possibly play, uh, teaching, all that stuff. And then uh, I think it was, it was a audition, I believe Randy Jackson was involved with. And um, it was right when J-Lo was starting her singing career. So that was actually really my first so-called high-profile gig. And I was like, well, this is cool. Maybe I'll try the Pop Avenue. And then um, ended up playing with some artists in Asia, came back, and immediately got the Jessica Simpson gig, which lasted about four and a half years. And some of that did have to do with being able to play metal, because metal guitar players did all the solos. So it kind of helped out, helped with me standing out in that sense, you know. And it was a lot of fun. I had a great time doing that. Um, simultaneously, I was teaching at MI, and as a metal guitar player, I think it was like the shred guitar class. Um, however, I noticed nighttime when I'd go out, I preferred dance clubs. So I went back to my disco roots, and I think it all kind of started coming together and I started producing more EDM with a little bit of hip hop stuff and thought, well, how could I do this as a live guitar player? So I put together this show that was like DJ mixed with live guitars doing mashups or EDMs. And it would not work at rock clubs whatsoever. However, I knew it would work at dance clubs. And I took the chance and that became actually my biggest gig at that point personally because it was under my name and everything was on my terms and it was just fun you know i mean six and a half years of pop gigs were great and i loved it for then 
but then playing raves and dance clubs, and I think, uh, well, by far the most people I pe- played for was a little over 300,000 people in Vietnam. It was like their ball drop, and it was full-on doing mashups and EDM tracks and my remixes, but with live guitars. And um, the recording process of it all kind of led me to get more into doing music for TV. Um, I'm trying to think, actually, the first TV placement, though, that I had was around 98. So that was still while I was doing other gigs, but uh, it was through another company. But I, w- I wasn't taking music licensing very seriously. Then I thought, oh, yeah, I'll get a track on TV once in a while, so I'll give it to some companies that that may or may not get it on TV, but I'll take a chance with it. And doing that helped me like learn how to produce you know, basically. And years later, I found that to come in more and more handy because the love for my guitar playing, I still loved it, but I was really enjoying the production end of things. So I started giving more tracks to TV shows or other companies that would get tracks onto TV. And then at one point, just thought, why not do this myself? Like, start my own company doing tracks for TV. So that's kind of how this started and um, now we mostly do reality shows like Kardashians and Total Divas and you know all those fun TV shows as well as like UFC and just whatever we can get our hands on and I'm really lucky that I started getting into production because due to a neck injury I can't really play much anymore Um, I got most of my life back but uh, there's a couple of things that's still not quite there and one of them is playing guitar. But I lucked out because I had started on the production end of things too, and I was able to make that into a business as well. And that wasn't on purpose. It wasn't on like purpose going, okay, I, won't be, I can't play guitar anymore, so I'm going to do production. I was already in the production mode when this happened. So um, anyway, that's pretty much how I ended up here, from Metalhead to doing music for the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I thought I had a variety of things, but, uh, well, <clears throat> my career started as a rhythm guitar player and a background singer for Rich Riley and the Tail Feathers, which was a, uh, sounds like the era that it was from. It was like kind of a Motown band. And, um, and, uh, Rich Riley was a really a great showman and sometimes he'd lose his voice and I found myself uh, kind of knowing where he'd lose his voice and, and you know, hitting the notes for him. And, and then one day he couldn't make it, and I realized that I knew all the songs, and I sang them. People went, where'd that come from? I said the same thing. And, and um, you know, I, I played in a – I started off, like, right out after high school and um, started making my living when I was 20, which is a number of decades ago. And um, – you know, I after doing that band thing for a while um, at Baby Huey's in Gardena, California, um, I started playing uh, in a club uh, where I was playing solo, doing cover songs. I still, a number of decades later, am still playing Tuesday nights at that same place. And something about it, just knowing that I can still play for four or five hours and learn new songs. And and that's where I learned how to entertain. And and it's it's just kind of a a sweet spot for me because when I first started playing there, there was a a bar that was right here, this close. And I'm singing like this. And I remember one night there was a, 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 must have been a vocal teacher. It's probably one of your friends. No, he's kidding. She's sitting right here and she's going, see how he's hitting the notes wrong and he's pulling chest and he's doing, you know, She's talking about describing how I'm singing wrong right in front of me with earshot, you know. I learned how to get thick enough skin to be able to continue, but not so thick that I would lose my sensitivity. And, but I learned by playing at a place where people weren't necessarily paying attention. If you can, if you can grab the attention of people that are three Mai Tais deep waiting two hours for dinner with dinner announcements going over this, uh, the PA system, then when you, by the time you get to a concert, 
it's like falling off a log. So it was actually a great experience. And I found that, you know, I could either say, forget this, I'm not going to do this, or I could learn from it. So, and um, I was writing songs, and um, I was getting a couple things recorded. And then my brother ran into this guy, Bobby Womack, who is an R&B legend, and... Um, wrote it all over now for the Stones and Breezin and had his own career, 40, 30, 40 albums and the soul man, soul man. And um, it was just great timing. And um, I showed up at the studio. Uh, he, my brother ran into him and talked him into, he bribed him with a, he knew that he liked cooking. So he gave him a cooking book from McCall's magazine where he was working at the time. And that kind of sealed the deal. He said, you know, you tell your brother, if he's what you say he is, you tell him to come up here and I'll see what he's got. So I'm waiting at the studio with uh, the meters, uh, the baddest rhythm section of all time, in my opinion, and um, Pointer Sisters, uh, Herbie Hancock, you know, Wow Wow Watson, all these people. I'm sitting there trying to act like, oh, yeah, I, I belong here. And um, so we go in, and, 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 and I had lyric sheets. I had a cassette. I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape. It was a couple years ago. And because um, there was going to be no way that he was not going to be able to listen to something from me. So he looked at some lyrics and he goes, you know, I like this. I tell you what, you come in. I got this a couple tracks. I've got just a few hook ideas over the top and uh, I'll be home in a couple days. If I like what you do, you're in. So the very first song that I worked on with him, I just happened that I worked I lived at a house with my brother, another guy that was kind of a party house, and and um, the song was called Daylight. You know, daylight's going to catch me up again. It was kind of so. I just told the story of what happened at our at our house, and and Bobby loved it, and he said, "Hey, I love this." And we worked together for 35 years, uh, writing songs together and and working. So that was kind of a, a break for me. But at the same time, at that time, you could knock on the door of a publisher. And even with one song, and 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 they, you could even go and play it live. Imagine that, you know. Now you can't. Now two guys have a three million dollar, three million song catalog, and you 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 can't pierce the corporate veil in any manner. But but those are the changes that happen. And so for me, it evolved into I started getting songs recorded from every everybody from folk acts to rap artists, and. Um, you know, I, I I love all types of music, and by by continuing to play gigs several nights a week, it kind of keeps me in touch with what's music, what music is going on. And plus, I love doing it, and it keeps my songwriting and improv chops together. What I do at clubs is I, uh, I think I mentioned I make up songs on the spot, and then people go, God, I, I wish I had a recording of that, and they go, Here, give me your email. And I sent it to them on the spot, which is kind of cool. They just had an anniversary or a birthday or just something crazy that I made up on the spot. Or I take a title from the audience. And, um, and so I started doing these custom songs. Um, and that, that is kind of what I'm shooting to have more, a larger part, because it's one song or two songs. And I make a, a lot more money doing that than I do playing a whole night. And it's, it's really cool. It's a little higher-end thing. And I also uh, started working a lot with a, there's a guy named Kyle Cease. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. He's kind of a transformational comic. He's kind of a, kind of a cross between male Ellen, a male Ellen and um, who's the guy I mentioned? Uh, Dwayne Dyer. Thanks. You know, if you know who any of those guys are. And uh, so uh, where he just makes it up, he's, he's got this huge following. We did... Five shows at the Alex Theater in Glendale, 1,400 seat, and two sold-out shows at the Dolby Theater. And he just goes up and makes it up as he goes, and I do the same thing. He'll just say, Harold, come on up, and I just take what he's been talking about. But, but you know, and people think improv is really kind of a, uh, you know, really difficult thing to do. But when you think about it, I'm talking right now. I'm saying something that I've never said before in my life with gestures and intonation and everything because we've, I've been doing it since I was one and a half or two years old. And so the improv is, 
it's, you know, conf you know, experience becomes confidence becomes, um, you know, trust. So I just trust, like when I'm speaking, that something's going to come out, and, and, and it usually does. So that's kind of all of what I'm doing, a combination of, of still playing cover gigs to keep my chops together, and uh, it's kind of the Jay Leno model, where while he was working at, uh, on The Tonight Show, he was playing every Sunday at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach to keep his act together, you know, and, and, and not comparing myself to him, but I, I really think that, that having a place, I've heard it said that 50 rehearsals equal one live performance in terms of what you get from it experience-wise and growth-wise. So um, that's kind of what I'm doing these days. Um, so I, you know, I started, I actually did a, if you know what a TED talk is, I, I did a TEDx talk about called preparing uh, for spontaneity, where I talked about how I learned to improvise. And, um, so, um, the other thing that I did, uh, someone suggested that I start going to the National Speakers Association convention, because I was doing a little speaking, but the main thing is that what I do is, I work with speakers where I make up songs for them and, and, and uh, MC and do different things like that. But I found that if you sing and talk in between, you make a few hundred dollars. If you talk and sing in between, which is the same thing, you make several thousand dollars. And you're more of a novelty in that world. You know, there's, instead of having 50,000 singer-songwriters pushing to try to get in the door, you stand out a little more. So the idea of cross-promoting in other areas is kind of cool. So I don't really need a microphone unless you, you want to hold it. For well, I have to sit because there's no strap. But anyway, I'll just do a little sample of that. Oh, shit. It was my flask. <laughs> so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just ask for a title from the audience, and I'll say something like, you know, uh, right now I'm going to give you, the audience, a chance to inspire this next song, mainly by giving me a song title, Ain't Child You Wish, not something that's been done before, something you've made up yourself, and I'm going to improvise a song right here on the spot, risking my reputation for your entertainment. And if there's more than one, oh, if there's more than one, we'll put it to a vote. So, uh, oh, she, he needs the microphone because he... No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. You know my lines. That's what I used to say, yeah, no pressure. So let me put this down a little bit. As if something brilliant is going to come forth. <laughs> so, so the way this works is, uh, so this is not Stump the Band, where you come up with a title that already exists. It's just where you give me a song title, just something off the top of your head. Don't give me your great opus that you've been saving, but just anything. Um, and if there's more than one, I'll put them together or we'll... I'll Pick one. So does anybody have a, yes, right here? Discomfort zone. Discomfort zone, okay. The red brick wall. The red brick wall, okay. Uh-oh, I, I should know with a bunch of musicians that are going to, yes. Purple light. Purple light, okay. Smile. Smile, okay. These white pants. <laughs> These white pants. Okay, and you. Okay. Usually the one that, that's the most unusual is the one that gets picked. Uh, sometimes I'll do this and do a applause meter, and, you know, I'm not going to take the time to do that right now. But So, Chris, you pick one. All right. Uh, who, who's. Oh, uh, that was. Yes. Uh, what what uh, musical style? Rock, reggae, blues, country, bossa nova? Country, okay. Which which country? No, just kidding. <laughs> what key? No, just kidding. I'd say it was an instrumental. No, just kidding. <laughs> of all the exciting titles that they gave to me, when you 
you look at that, there's not a whole lot of things you can write about and not much history. I think about the guy that put all those bricks together and the cement in between. That's the coolest red brick wall I've ever seen. And there's one strip in the middle up there that didn't quite turn out right. It's because he parked in front of a fire hydrant and had to escape quickly into the night. Oh, that's what happened with the red brick wall. It's so damn tall. That red brick wall. got shorter as he went along but not quite as short as this song yeah about a red big wall that pretty much says it all that's what happens in this biz gotta make it up as you go and try to be a whiz Make up something interesting about a red brick wall. Thank you. Uh, it's trust and rust. No, no. I didn't turn on my recorder, but what the heck? Or did I? We'll have it on it. Um, so, do we have any questions yet? No, I don't. Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> well, they want to hear it on the. Oh, okay. okay. I, was, I was just going to ask Harold um, how do you kind of. What sort of like mental headspace do you get in before you go up to do something like that, to do an improv like that? Um, is it one of just like totally no expectations and no, uh, yeah, like no pressure on yourself to like do anything crazy and then from having no pressure all this stuff comes out because it's like you don't even care really? <laughs> well, it's like you do care. You want, to ha you want it to come out well, but it's like, you know what I mean? You can't have this high expectation for what you're going to do, I feel like. How do you prepare yourself to do that? Well, the really preparation is from doing it thousands of times, really, and from that comes the trust that I just, I know something is going to come out. And at a certain point, sometimes it's just, uh, it's being what I call, um, what do I call it? Uh, where, where you just uh, observe what's happening uh, in the room and, you know, embrace the elephant in the room, you know, and if you mess up a line you, or, or you go up, well, I'm not going to rhyme that line and you put it in the song and there's something about that connection with the audience that, that they're very forgiving because they know you're doing it in the minute moment. And there's, there's also something about that takes the pressure off because they don't expect that much because if you do anything, they're probably, you mention the title and they're already like, but if you can do it well, so because the bar is, is kind of low of expectation, in a way it buoys you up a little bit. That's all I, but as far as my mental headspace, I just, by playing the guitar, there's just a symbiotic relationship between my voice and guitar and I just play something and I just go there. Because a lot of times when I do recap improv, I'm writing down lyrics and I'm thinking what the melody is going to be and, and don't have a chance to rehearse it, so I just go up there. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right, so I got a quick question for my man in the middle. So uh, first, <laughs> first, I just want to let you know I uh, teched for Marty Friedman today, so I thought you might want to know that because... You could appreciate that. Um, but, uh, no, I was wondering, you said you, you can't play anymore. And, uh, right, you said you can't. Pretty much. Well, I can 
physically play it for a couple of minutes, but yeah. the desire inside of my body will like blow up. Okay, so fair question. So for me, um, I have arth- I have rheumatoid arthritis, and um, I'm a guitarist also, and some days are way worse than others, and I can like literally feel myself getting worse <laughs> like as a guitarist how do you how do you mentally accept or just kind of like i mean prepare i mean uh, you've had time now but how do you really come to terms with knowing that that might never come back or that you you like you can't really be what you know if that makes sense does that question make sense Um, Well, your situation is a little different than mine, and I'm sorry to hear that you're going through that. Um, For me, since I was already on the production end of things, it wasn't as huge of a deal because I wasn't playing guitar on the recordings as much. So it's already a different headspace as far as that goes. Um, I did go through a, a different injury a long time ago where I had to take a couple of months off and at that point in my life it was really difficult you know um i don't know if guitar is your only love or not and hopefully you'll be able to do it 100 percent without any pain but as far as getting to the right headspace just you know stay positive and if you do other stuff within music like still create still stay you know, I'm talking if the and just in case the worst case scenario, if you're still being a musician, I th- there you go. So if you can do that, then you can, I think, shift the passion to a certain degree. You know, um, I mean, guitar still feels great for me to play while I do it, and sometimes I will for ten minutes, even knowing the outcome. You know, and it's like, okay, well, it'll hurt tomorrow for tonight later, but no big deal. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, obviously you're doing all the treatments possible and all that, but really find other things within music that make you happy, you know, or the arts that make you happy. And uh, hopefully it won't resort to that, but in case it did, you'd have something else you love just as much. Because I can honestly say I love, you know, making tracks as much as I loved guitar at one point. So maybe writing songs will become like your favorite thing to do you know I sure Can I, yeah if you don't mind i just want to say that i've had some arthritic challenges as well and recently my hands and i wear braces when i play for any length of time but that's part of the reason why they're doing the one song custom song so if you can find you know you know shorter things that you where you're not playing for a long period of time and i'm sure where you're also, if you're recording, it, you you do some loops and you know, so you don't have to play that much. And and uh, and Embril, what are, you know what Embril is? It's it's a medication that people take that that kind of stops, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. Th- theoretically, I'm not a doctor, but I know some people that. <laughs> take them. Anyway, I have some for sale here if you want. No, just kidding. <laughs> Joe, will you, will you talk about, you know, you said about production, you started to get into production. Um, was, talk about how you started getting involved in production a little bit. Like, well, how, did, okay. what, what, how did you start? I bought this MIDI controller like a week ago, and I don't know how to use it yet. But I'm curious because I okay. kind of started to start getting into the production. The production? My, my first multi-track recording was literally a Radio Shack tape player and like some Van Halen playing in the background with everything turned to the right, I believe, where Michael Anthony was playing. We, you know, you'd hear the bass but not the guitar as much. And that was my first multi-track recordings. <laughs> but um, no, the recording thing came out of just my love of writing as well. So it went from doing it that way to um, four tracks to eight track digital and then eventually the computer. So um, does that kind of answer the question about? Yeah, like right now I have, it's at my house, you know, and and have 
full-on MIDI controlled things. And I can record a little bit of live stuff there, vocalists and guitars. But at this point, it's pretty much all turn, you know, in the box, sort of. So, and I love it. I love the challenge of that. It's got different challenges, and it's it's not as live, but it's still fun, you know. It's it depends on the type of music you're doing too, as far as the live thing goes. If you really need um, true guitars on the track, or if MIDI guitars actually work better on that particular style, you know, which I know guitar players wouldn't huh, for metal to that, right? <laughs> Um, just depends, uh, you know, as far as styles go, what works well as far as staying in the box goes. But yeah, all my stuff as far as home goes, it's 95% plus in the box. Thank you three for coming. Um, this one's for Gerald. I'm kind of familiar with how to become a SAG member as an actor, but how do you go about that as a singer or as a vocalist? Is there like a special route you have to take or? Um, it's basically the same process. So as an actor, you have to get uh, a line in a show, right? Or and where you get Taff Heart lead. So the same thing in the, in the music world. As singers, we work on the same contract as an actor does. So we're on a day player contract. We get the same pay rates, and you get you get in by getting what they call Taff Heart Lead, which means a producer or a vocal contractor has to request you to the guild, and the guild has to approve it. And basically, what this what the statement is saying is that there's nobody else in this city or country that can do what we need you to do, so we have to bring you into the fold. So, and we know that that's not always the case, but that's how we all got in. So you have to get requested. Once you get requested, you'll have 30 days to um, pay. I think it's $3,000 now to join. Um, but then you get full benefits and pension and all that kind of stuff. But it's the same process as acting. Two for, one for Gerald. Uh, Gerald, I'm a SAG after member on the actor side, commercial side. And I've been thinking about the idea of going to voiceovers, and I've recorded and produced them for other people, but now putting myself front, right front and center. What does SAG after have in terms of resources, and also what tips can you give me in finding out my niche, or niche, how do you say it? niche, niche? Uh, for where my particular personality and my persona might go is a starting point to try to enter into the voiceover uh, market. I honestly don't know a lot about voiceover. I know it, it, it is included in the same, what we were talking about, the acting as far as getting in. Um, but each of those worlds are their own separate worlds, like the acting world is that, the session singing world is is what it is in the voiceover world. I, it's a whole new group of people, you know. Um, as far as finding your niche, I th I think the answer to that is like saying yes to everything because you you don't know, you think you know exactly what you want to do, but in the meantime, that if that has not worked out yet, a lot of times we shun all the things that come from the side. Like he was talking about the production when he was a, a metal player. Um, and those things that come along, if you say yes to everything, you're going to try everything, you're going to be heard by more people, you're going to meet more people, um, you'll know if you're good at it or not, or somebody will let you know if you're good at it or not. Um, so I just say take every opportunity. There's a, a, on the sixth or seventh floor at SAG, there's a, a voiceover workshop studio that they use and they let the members come and take it, advantage of that studio. By the way, if anybody's a member, um, you just have to go there. You just have to go there and go up to the seventh floor and ask and they'll, they'll tell you. Thank you. 
Well, I wanted to thank you guys for all coming out. I think it's cool that you guys all have different perspectives. Um, I want to do what all of you guys do, so I guess i got to clone myself. Um, but um, I guess this is for you for now, Gerald. I have questions for you two later. Um, to follow up to that sag after stuff, um, I was wondering, in order to get taft Heart lead, obviously, you have to be going out to a lot of auditions, and I know that just from experience, a lot of these things are relationship. So a lot of times they don't really, if they know you can deliver, then, and if you've had the experience, um, then, you know, a lot of times you'll get gigs that way. Um, that's been my experience. But I just wanted to ask you, um, like, I guess, how would you go about increasing your chances of getting taft Heart lead? Like, what kind of situations do I need to be putting myself in and what sort of things do I need to have ready? Um, I think it goes back to what I was saying a little earlier about taking every opportunity. Um, one of my biggest regrets, and this is in answer to your question, is I, I was doing all these side jobs, like I was, I was teaching, I was substitute teaching school. I was doing what I needed to do to make money. But, and I didn't want to do a lot of the things that I was told in the industry, you have to go to the parties and you have to get your demos done and you have to go to the auditions. And I just, a lot of that I didn't like and a lot of that I didn't think I needed to do. So I didn't take those opportunities, which is why I felt like it was, in my mid thirties when I got my first job because at one point um, somebody told me you need to go join after at the time you could just join they said you need to go join it was probably sixteen hundred dollars in and take this class called sight singing which is a class that I now teach which is a whole another story but when I, I didn't want to take the class because I already had two degrees you know, I, I thought, I mean, I didn't think I knew it all, but I, I didn't think I needed a, a, a music class. And it was that kind of attitude that I think held me back for a long time. Because I just had my mindset, I'm going to be a session person, and I don't want to do anything else that gets in the way. Um, when I took that class, however, I met, my teacher was Stan Farber, who was the voice of Happy Days. Sunday, Monday, Happy Days. Um, which was like, oh my God, this is incredible because that's what I want to do. And he was the teacher of the class. I didn't know that at the time. And then he brought in a guest who was a lady who still hires me today, um, 15 years later or whatever. And she, um, I was trying to think what, she's, she does like the Simpsons, uh, family guy. And I had sent her material for seven years. So that was back when we had cassette tapes. You mentioned tapes earlier. I would send out boxes and boxes and boxes of, of a demo cassette, and I never heard back. But I didn't do it often. I did it once every two months. I would send out another set. You didn't really know how to follow up because it was all mail then. There was no email and all that kind of stuff. And so for seven years, she never responded. And then I ended up in this class at the Guild, and she came as a guest and Stan said, you know what, Sally, you need to hire this guy. He's really good. She had never heard me. She still hadn't heard my demo that I'd sent her. It's probably sitting in her closet somewhere. And that was my, that was the, my intro gig to the world that I now exist in, in the session thing. But it, it came from doing all, everything you can possibly do. Every party you can go to, it's a musician party. Go to the, the school events go to take as many classes as you can on the music business and the things you like being here tonight, meeting as many people as you can. And then in that class, um, Stan retired, the guy that taught it, and said, do you want to teach this class? And I, again, I thought, you know, I really don't. I didn't move to L.A. to teach theory. And, but I wasn't doing a lot of session stuff yet. And I said, you know what, why not? I met I met this guy. I, I get this lady that's hired me for my first job. So something's happening here. So I said, yes, I'll take the class. Well, fast forward 15 years, I've been teaching it ever since. And I thought, I'll only do this for a couple of months. So and that everything leads. You have a book, right? You have a book now. And everything, everything leads to everything. 
And I can't stress that enough on the connection that you make through your, you know, the, everything you go and do. So I hope that. Because you know, there is a singer's network, you know. Um, when Sarah came in and spoke, uh, when I, I had people, so another singer come in and speak about singing and what she did and things like that. And um, she goes, you know, a bunch of us get together and have breakfast and hang out and get to know each other and stuff like that. And so um, I had a girl here that um, wanted to get involved in that, and so I introduced them by email. And now she's doing, she's singing, doing singing voiceovers. And it's because she gets to know that singer's network, and you share, you know, they need a choir, so you call your, your friends, and that's kind of how you, you start doing it. So, you know... That's kind of the way it goes. Just one other little thing is sometimes if there's someone that you think might be helpful to you and you have some sort of access to them, sometimes you can say, hey, can I acquire your services? Can I take you to lunch or whatever? And oftentimes they'll, they'll do it and not even try. But even if they do, I mean, if you sat down, let's say, with somebody – like a Gerald and pick their brain and, and whatever, I mean, and, and offer to pay them something to do that, whether they take it or not. I mean, it's one way to get direct, and then they maybe can hear what you do. And, it, you know, it's not always easy to do that, but sometimes you can do that. So just a thought to go directly. I have, I have a friend who um, wanted to do voiceovers, and he started taking a voiceover class. And the teacher who was teaching the voiceovers we're looking for voiceover people. So, um, you know, um, sometimes taking an improv class so you can think about another way to sing it or, or you know, do something else. So um, the people who teach that are in the field already. So we... Yeah, so, you know, I mean, we're always learning. We're always ta everybody's always taking more classes. I'm always doing webinars and all that kind of stuff. We've got to keep learning. And, and it's, you know, the online's great, but it's about being in the room and who are talking to the person who's next to you. And it's a, it really is as simple as that. This is a really small music business world. And, you like, he, 15 years ago he was sharing a room with somebody, and then all of a sudden – you know, it, it happens because you know somebody from the past. And I always say a musician will ever get, always give another musician work. So if I can't do it, then I want to give it to somebody I think who's good. So you got to know that. So if you want to do session work, then you got to go out there and do the jams, and people have to know you're available and all that kind of stuff. It's not easy. Like you said, maybe I don't want to go to the parties, but you, you really have to. So maybe you need to take a networking class or how to, how to work the room called Dan Compel or somebody like that. I mean, you, it, there's lots of ways for you to, to start interacting. Sometimes it's with if you're doing singing and you get introduced to Gerald or someone who's like a singer, they'll bring you into their crowd, and then that's how it grows. Thanks for coming. Um, I had a question for Harold, just about songwriting. So you've probably written like tens of thousands of improv songs over the years in the moment, like those in the moment types ones. But now you said you're doing more of the um, custom ones, which I guess you write in advance to then present to the groups. So I was just wondering if, um, I don't know which one you did first. I think you probably said you were doing the improv more first. But what kind of, uh, I guess, things from doing the improv maybe helped you now when you're writing songs like that you're maybe working on for a longer period of time or vice versa if there was anything from like the regular songwriting process that helps you on the improv sign just kind of like back and forth between the two yeah i mean just the songwriting skills in general from having written song so many songs and you know but sometimes it's immediately somebody will say a song and I know where I'm going to go with it because I'm so used to writing to a title, which is the way I think a lot of people write songs. If you're writing, you know, pop songs or whatever, that, that you start off with a central theme and usually that's 
the first end or last line of the chorus and it's a title. It's not always that way, but sometimes I'll take it the opposite way that somebody thinks I'm going to take it if I'm doing improv. But people saw me doing improv and said, hey, can you come to this party and, you know, do that? But sometimes I make it look so easy that they don't expect to, you know, and I give them, give it away. So sometimes they don't appreciate the custom song. So, but fortunately I have meeting planners and stuff that, that book me for a lot of those higher-end events and things. But, but I'd say that just songwriting in general, it's like, a, a, it's like writing a song with a really sh quick deadline is, is really what it is. And I've done a lot of, of writing on assignment over the years. And so that was the led up to being able to uh, do the improv thing. And, and there's some, I think, techniques back and forth that, between the custom and the improv, but when you think about it, when you do a custom song, somebody's giving you all this information, so it, you, you know, half the job is done in terms of, you know, you're not having reaching to the sky to go, what am I going to write about? And so you, I get, I have a questionnaire, and people will send in emails, give me all this information, and then, you know, I, 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 the improv experience of knowing what will get a laugh and, you know, the roast and toast aspect of it and, and just performing so much, I, I feel like I can tell what the person in the back row had for breakfast. You know, it's, uh, you know, bacon. Uh, but um, so it kind of, it, it all, one washes the other. I just had a general question for whoever would like to answer it. Um, I grew up on uh, country music and classic rock and gospel and kind of the whole nine uh, hodgepodge of stuff. Um, I tend to write a lot outside of my genre that I perform, and I'm kind of curious as to where I should take that music. As well. like, I mean, I know at the shows that I play or when we tour or anything like that, I'll throw in a couple of those songs but it's like it's it's not really something that's within my market of what I feel I'm going for so I have complete songs and I'm just kind of wondering like where would where would y'all recommend I pitch that as far as like who to take those to I mean like aside from just being like hey check this out hey check this out I mean obviously we're we're in the business of hey check this out but aside from that I mean what uh I mean, you know, you, you do sync, right? So, I mean, something along those lines, I'm just genuinely curious as to, like, I mean, while we're here, do y'all know anybody that is interested in hearing <laughs> random songs that people have catalogs of and things like that? I mean, I'm just kind of genuinely curious while we're here. Um, are they fully produced? Or are they... They're demos. Um, with syncs, it's definitely most publishers are going to want to hear full produced. So um, in your particular case, I would recommend getting together with a producer until you, you know, get, yeah, like a producer like Robert. <laughs> and, um, and if you're the right singer for it, great. If you're not, you know, uh, there's probably plenty in this room that would be, you know, and find the right person to sing the song, figure out the splits you want ahead of time, you know, um, if you're going to pay them up front or if you're going to uh, do a little bit of royalty exchange, basically, you know. Uh, and then publishers, you definitely want to send them full-on produced tracks. Don't do demos, you know, I, at least from my experience, you know. Okay. It's like something that's somewhat marketable, but it's just not like full band, it's not full, like that's what I mean by demo. Right. It's sync for T iPhone, Yeah, yeah. Um video. yeah, for that sync for T V or film, I would still recommend having it fully done to whatever style that's gonna that you think it's gonna fit the best and have a catalog for that. If you're shopping for Singers, I believe at this point, I mean, I'm not really in that per side of the game, but 
um, for pop singers and stuff like that, I believe they're, they're still going to want to hear it as well produced as possible. Just because so many people have access to recording studios now that from, you know, from everything I see now, it's pretty much you got to have the full band unless it's meant for, you know, singer songwriter that's fully stripped down like that. Yeah. In that case, you already have the perfect, you know, production. So anyone else want to add? I'd say, and if that's the case, I wouldn't call it a demo. Yeah. Because that's, it's a full production for what you want. And, and it's, of course, it's changed a lot um, to get song, you know, syncs is kind of where is the kind of the last, um, you know, area where you, it's, people are getting songs in because uh, if you want to get a song to an artist, first you have to go, all right, does that artist write all their own material? And, you know, there are some areas where there are some openings and it's just a matter of going down one, two, three, four degrees of separation to get into that and uh, finding ways to unconventional ways, like having a family member, you know, go up to somebody or some people dive in and hand something or, or find somebody's Facebook page and send, I mean, you know, get creative um, with getting songs to people. I have a question for you yeah. regarding him. Yeah. Um, it, are the gatekeepers to the licensing world the music supervisors? Partially. So, if, who if, are those people? Like, it would be usually a publisher, unless the music supervisor already trusts you, because the music supervisor would call a company like us or you know somebody bigger in in that sense or smaller, and say, whoever they trust already, and say, hey, we need these types of tracks, what do you got for me? And at that point, there's no way I can say, well, I got this one song. It, even though yours may be, you know, fully produced. So the gate, there's a line of gatekeepers, you can say. Okay, um, as far as we go, I screen all the tracks myself. But as we expand, I'm sure somebody else will be too. So then there will be a gatekeeper even to get to this step, and then the music supervisor is going to get it from me or whoever else, along with you know uh, thousands of other tracks. And they, you know, um, last year I heard the music supervisor say he put out a um, request for a Christmas song, and he got six thousand tracks from that, and he had to narrow it down to like a hundred before he could send it off to the director. That's a lot huger than what we're doing, <laughs> but but still, um, that's kind of the that's why you can't say well this one would be really cool uh, if it was fully produced. And if I may, I just to say one thing is pair up with someone who has what you don't have. You know, get a partner that is a that has a studio, and either write with them or have them be the production side of what you do and and they get the production side and you get the writing side or some way pair up with, because sometimes if even in a collaboration situation, get two people that are more lyric oriented, it's not as, as pragmatic as finding someone who kind of covers the territory that you don't. Um, yeah, but as far as the gatekeeper, the final step before the director would be what you started with, the supervisor. But then before that is what I was kind of right. saying. So how did they find you? Okay, um, we chased them down <laughs> to start with. Um, everything from emails to, this goes back to a lot of what others have said here. I have made drives for several hours out somewhere where I know someone's going to be at a panel that I want to talk to. you know. And then I've hung out at a certain bar for way longer than needed to get the right opportunity to talk to a certain client. You know, I've been at parties where I'm about to leave, client comes in and wants to start drinking. Um, and about three weeks ago, I literally did chase somebody down. Like she was walking from one side of the room to another and I knew she, she was just about to get mobbed and I completely ran <laughs> across the room. Um, but then once you build a trust, that's when they will reach out to you 
on their regular, hey, you know what, last time we called them and we needed a turnaround within 48 hours, they did it. And we didn't even expect it, but they had the album cover and everything done in that time. So then they'll start calling you or emailing you. Um, you can, I mean, we, we've done plenty of cold, cold calls and emails. And just every single way you can imagine, I mean, go to all the parties, you know, find out where someone's going to be, stalk them. Yeah. You know? So... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, to add to that, um, it you said it earlier too. It's just being you got to be in the room with the people, and and somebody asked earlier, is there a website that where you can find all the singers or you can find all the the songs being chopped? Those websites, from what I've seen, come and go. They come along and then they disappear. Fire is through each other, so it's being at the bar. You know, chasing the person down, but there's a face-to-face -face spirit. You know, person-to-person -person connection that call it old-fashioned, but it's it's what I feel works. So, like the people that are the, you know, the like be it, taking the acting classes. You were talking about what can I do to get more auditions and stuff like that. You may not want to spend the money, but that's that's what that's one of those things that people just do. They they take the classes at the end of the classes. They bring in sometimes a panel of, of agents to see if any of the people that were in the class are, you know, want to be signed with those agents. So anytime you can be around other people doing what you do, because like the contractors in, in our business, it's con they call it, they're called contractors or like agents, but um, they, they don't go to websites. They just don't. They, they call people they know, like sometimes, I was mentioning Tim early, he'll call me up and say, you know, I'm looking for a singer, blah, blah, blah. Because then they know there's a trust, like yeah, you mentioned. Trust. There's a trust value there that's not, you're not going to find on a website. You have no idea if that person's going to show up on time or if they bathed the night before. Or, I mean, seriously, I mean, you just, you see everything, so. I'm just going to say that, you know, you're probably sitting next to someone who, five years from now is going to be some contact for you that you probably didn't realize because the people that are showing up for things like this are the people that are going to be moving forward.